keep moving. Um, this next session, uh, as we get started, is uh, with uh, a colleague of mine from CDL, Maria Pretzelis, uh, Cynthia Hudson Vitel from ARL, uh, American Research Library, Asso the Association of Research Libraries, and then um, myself. I'm involved, so I will be jumping in and helping with speaking as well. Um, but I think, Maria, if you want to go ahead and get started, and uh, you're already sharing your screen, so I think we're all set. Alrighty, and my apologies for not sharing um, video. My Wi-Fi has been unreliable today, so I am playing it safe. Um, so welcome to our no-nonsense PIDtastic guide to implementing effective data practices. Um, after Todd's presentation, I really wish that we had some awesome origami to accompany this report, and now it feels like sad. Like, I, I really wish that we had some origami because that was really fun. Um, but anyway, so this um, presentation comes out of a National Science um, Foundation funded conference um, that the California Digital Library organized with the Association of Research Libraries, ARL, um, with the American Association of Universities, AAU, and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, um, which is um, APLU. Um, so we, as institutions, have been sort of long involved with advancing open science. Um, and we came together um, as organizations to um, convene this conference and really continue our work and move, make it, um, move it to the next level. So just a quick shout out to our project team. Um, I am feeling like some of you folks actually maybe attended this conference. Um, this was the organizing committee. Um, so you'll recognize John from Pitapalooza, Maria Gould, um, another rock star Pitapalooza person. Um, so we had a really great um, group of people that all came together to organize this conference. So what we're gonna talk about today at this presentation is the results of our conference, but we're also focusing on um, the toolkit that we put together to really share out and help the community take the findings of the conference and share it to their organization. So hopefully to promote more um, effective data practices locally. So this toolkit um, really is designed to use the content from the report in conversations within your own local organizations and institutions. It's divided by um, specific stakeholders. So you take a certain component and then you for say um, researchers and you could use that portion of the toolkit to speak directly to researchers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's in that toolkit. Then Cynthia is going to facilitate some interactive discussion session with you all. And then John is going to wrap up and offer some closing thoughts. So this project, um, which includes again, the conference, the report and the toolkit that we're gonna talk about today, all kind of came about out of a um, to your colleague letter that the National Science Foundation um, put out in May of 2019. And this was a really important um, dear colleague letter, especially for you know this space, um, in that it explicitly recommended two uh, well-established best practices for managing data and gave it the sort of funder push for you know, implementing those practices. And those two practices are, first of all, assigning um, persistent identifiers for data sets. And then second, creating machine readable or active data management plans. So um, some of the, the core component of this work really is the understanding that PIDs connect the elements of scholarship. Um, that's really a core um, uh, behind the Dear Colleague letter and behind our work because it really is the PIDs that find that allow us to connect those elements of scholarship. So in our report um, and in our project, we recommended five core PIDs to be implemented. And those were ORCIDs for people, um, ROARs for organizations, grant, or, grant IDs, um, publications and data, DOIs, and then um, assigning a uh, cross-ref funder registry ID to identify the funding source. 
The other core component of the Dear Colleague letter and our work is really looking at active DMPs um, or machine actionable data management plans. And, really, and we talked a little bit about this in the session that we did earlier, um, but really the goal about uh, machine actionable DMPs is to facilitate um, a research data management system that allows data and information about research to be communicated across stakeholders. Um, so again, that links things like metadata, repositories, and institutions, all powered by PIDs. Um, and the, the goal of this in, a, well, one of the goals in the big picture scheme is really to have a, um, is to lessen the administrative burden on researchers and grant administrators. We need to build tools and systems that are easier to use, that make it easier to exchange information, to keep information up to date, about research projects without burdening, um, without an additional burden on researchers or grant administrators. So those are our kind of fundamental goals um, and ideas um, powering our work in this space. So the project, of course, began, kicked off with the conference that we held last December in DC. Um, it was, you know, kind of funny to think back about everybody meeting in person, but thankfully we, we were still able to do that at that point. Um, after this meeting, um, it was a day and a half, um, we took all of our notes from the meeting, which really focused on a lot of open discussions about the challenges of implementing effective data practices at various institutions from different stakeholder perspectives. We assembled all of those notes and created a set of draft guidelines. Um, we submitted these to the, the the folks that attended the conference for feedback. We also reached out to additional stakeholders who weren't able to be with us at the live conference. So we kind of iterated on it, added some things based on feedback. Um, and so the people that really, the voices that made up this report and the audience for this report included um, leaders of libraries, uh, senior IT personnel, senior research officers, um, tool builders, and researchers themselves. Um, so those are really the, the groups that came together in creating these guidelines, um, and also the groups we focused on in terms of implementing the things. Um, so everything that we're talking about today, um, the report and the toolkit um, is on that ARL website, and I don't see the chat, but I'm assuming that it's probably in there, and if it's not, it will be. Um, so I'm going to dive now into the um, communication uh, toolkit. So that's what we are really focusing on presenting today. Uh, we focused on kind of assembling all of our findings from this conference and the report into a lightweight communications toolkit um, that we based um, on our report and our recommendations. So everything in the toolkit is fully customizable and reusable for your local institution. So that includes things like all of the um, shareable slides, um, handouts, discussion questions, um, the reading list that we put together for conference participants in order to prepare. Um, must be the sort of library side of me, but I do love a good reading list. And it really gives, it was really designed to give um, kind of grounded background reading about how these data practices emerged in the first place to be recommended by NSF and kind of how we're taking that forward. Um, we also did several really great kind of video interviews. Um, Cynthia was really involved with that, um, with key stakeholders, interviewing them about their thoughts about this, about this space, um, how they see these data practices being implemented, challenges they think um, might um, might emerge. So it's also a great way to hear from different experts in the community about um, their thoughts on that. So those are all curated and available um, through that ARL link. Um, everything, of course, is CC BY, and we're really hoping that it will be helpful in facilitating conversations um, that we really need to have locally in order to take these best practices and have them implemented on the ground um, at institutions. So we really tried to be focused on very practical, concrete things that folks could do. Uh, that was kind of our mission there. 
Um, so our recommendations, like I mentioned, they're grouped by stakeholder, um, which is kind of represented here in the stakeholder pyramid. Um, so the, the bottom um, kind of core of this is that we have um, community related standards. Um, and this really is reflecting that um, the standards and the PIDs and the machine actionable space really do come from the research community themselves and or groups like Pitapalooza and R all the RDA working groups that really um, maintain a lot of these standards and are constantly building on them and promoting them and iterating on them. So we we're very grounded in that, in that space. Um, but, you know, above that, we have the government um, and funder policies that are moving a lot of this um, work, tool builders and publishers supporting this new ecosystem. And um, between all of this and researchers really is um, that institutional research and support services, which was an, a principal think, uh, stakeholder that we were really focusing on as we developed this um, toolkit. So we're really focusing on them and how to make these practices doable, doable and really achievable. And then of course, at the top, we have researchers. So ultimately everything is you know, coming to a point at that point and really designed to support them in their work. Um, so the key finding I think in looking at the stakeholder pyramid and really thinking through it was that in order to make this really doable, we needed a system that is focused on being open and collaborative. Um, so the more um, effective services are going to be, are really um, need, need open communication and collaboration throughout um, the stakeholder pyramid. So diving into the report, we again, we've organized it by um, stakeholder. Um, so at the, at the beginning of the report, we have really high level recommendations, um, you know, that apply to all stakeholders, um, things like the four, four PIDs. Um, and then we have broken it down to specific stakeholders. So in the beginning, we have an introductory context where it's just sort of placing the group, in this case, researchers within the larger ecosystem. Moving into it, we've got incentives um, for adoption. So why, um, why researchers um, would be interested in adopting these new practices, the idea being you can take some of those incentives and use it when you're communicating um, with the stakeholder group. And then of course, the actual recommendation. So the meat of the report, what are we saying that, that researchers should do or whatever stakeholder you're looking at? So, um, we do want to stress that we acknowledge that some of these recommendations are going to be much easier to, <laughs> to implement than others. Um, but like I mentioned, they really are, they were written and thought of to be very concrete, practical, practical and achievable. Um, and importantly, already widely endorsed by the community where I don't think we're going out on a limb and <laughs> offering anything particularly radical in these recommendations. So again, the, the toolkit here really is to help facilitate these conversations, in this case with researchers, and address some discussions that might come up um, as you discuss these data practices um, with your communities. So moving into the toolkit presentation, um, these are the shareable slides um, that you can customize um, for your institution. Um, they've got things like um, the specific value proposition for the stakeholder, um, the recommendations themselves. Um, we definitely want to encourage folks to modify the slides as they need to, to add additional information about maybe services um, or tools that you offer locally that could help folks. Um, you want to customize it to add um, where people could go for help in um in attaining some of these changes um all of the um again i mentioned that reading list that we circulated is included in the handouts here um, we've got things like the the discussion questions so if you want to facilitate a, a conversation with your own um, groups we have some suggestions for discussion questions um, again the five key takeaways the five core 
kids, um, that really power findability. And then our core recommendations to all stakeholders at the high level with incentives. So these are all kind of wrapped together nicely in the form of a toolkit. So just um, the discussion questions that I mentioned were really thought out to help you um, really to collaborate more at an institutional level about how to implement these practices. Um, so things like um, what gaps might exist in your current workflows, um, how, um, how you might advance these new um, data practices in order to address these gaps. So really another, thinking about this as another opportunity to have a very concrete discussion locally about what you need to evolve to do, but also to promote what you are doing, right? It's not all about like what, what we aren't doing and things that we need to, to change, but it's also celebrating um, and acknowledging um, services and people that are already supporting some of these projects or um, uh, activities locally at their institutions. So I think at that point, I'm gonna pass it to Cynthia for some actual um, discussion here. Um, and I will keep sharing. Great. Um, thank you, Maria. And um, now we really wanna hear from the audience, from uh, the folks that have decided to join us today. Um, the first question we have, and let me pull up the Padlet link in the chat. Um, we really want to hear from you. Uh, what, like if, if this vision for a connected um, for connected PIDs for, for what we've discussed through the conference actually came to um, <laughs> came to fruition. Sorry, I'm also distracted by the chat on the side of the screen. Um, what would success look like for you? What would success for the implementation of machine actionable data management plans and PIDs look like within your organization? How would that, uh, you all can take a minute. Um, if you're not familiar with Padlet, you just hit that little pink plus sign in the corner. Um, and, and it'll pop up like a little virtual sticky note and you can you can uh, write your little comment there. And I'm really interested to hear from folks who are here, like what do you see at your institution if, if there was a possibility for a machine actionable or a machine readable data management plan, what benefit would that bring you? Um, <laughs> people actually update it, that's nice. Notification of the intent to use, that's huge. Um, let's see. Notification of researchers intend to use. Yeah, maybe one thing while um, people are jumping in there is just, you know, to think about the, the framing of this entire project was really around trying to take guidance okay. from a national funder. So in the United States, um, NSF, dear colleague letters are, um, are community-based letters where researchers talk to researchers about best practice. And so we took this DCL that came from the NSF, which is one of the biggest funders in the US, but also one of the biggest funders globally, where they were finally putting some discussions specifically around PIDs, right? So we've been looking for this kind of evolution of community of practice for so long. And it finally came in this, this form of this DCL, which may sound like a dry thing to some, but for NSF funders, it's a very influential guidance document or a recommendation from the community to the community. And we were able to say like, wow, let's, let's, let's leverage this point and try to see how we can turn this into ways for campuses and other communities to really adopt that energy and create some no nonsense ways of people to kind of, to actualize what was in that DCL. And so there are a lot of things that we could or could have not talked about when it came to PIDs, but we were like focused on like, how do you take this, this energy point that was created and extended out? And one of the challenges that we talk about a lot at Pitapalooza is um, how do we translate the, the PIDs, the nerdy stuff around PIDs into various communities? And many times we talk about that in terms of um, how do technical people who work in the back end translate it to researchers? Or how do librarians and information scientists type people 
translate that into their work and to researchers? And how do those three groups talk to each other? But the reality is a lot of the conversations that need to happen are actually in the funding cycle. So the funders themselves or the research offices on campuses or the grants offices on campuses, why should they care about PIDs? Why should they care about um, data management plans? And why should they care to make sure that the plan that's put in the grant for the managing of data and other outputs, why should they care that that is actually machine actionable, meaning it's been pitified and it's something that can be used later on? And so what we were trying to do is create guidance that was like across those community and created some no-nonsense ways so that we could actually start to influence and make all these different communities that really matter really understand what that DCL was really about. And so when we're talking about this project, it's really about like translating something that was this kind of funder thing on the website into something that these other communities could actually take and run with. Um, and so that was filler um, <laughs> information while people were able to, uh, to put information on the uh, Padlet. Well so maybe, done. Cynthia, you want to run through? Some yeah, uh, folks can also like upvote certain comments too. I think one thing that has gotten a lot of um, positive votes uh, on what success for the implementation would look like is being able to read or access DMPs within our institution. I mean, that's, that's, that seems like an amazing like first step, right? Like if you can have access to them, then you can support the infrastructure that they're mentioning. You can um, possibly uh, project what sort of needs there are for storage or for preservation. I mean, that's, that's huge from an institutional perspective. Um, oh, there's also a lot of upvoting around incorporating data principles into all graduate training programs. Certificate programs should be offered, oops, it moved, um, for postdoctoral peeps at all career stages. And then someone else commented, success would actually be having it woven into graduate student policy. It's not just nice to have, but it should be something we expect all PhDs to leave their program with. I mean. Uh, yeah, I could see that being huge too. Like if um, graduate students were required to take good data management practice trainings and understand what a persistent identifier is and, and add it uh, or have an ORCID or, um, you know, understand the need for a DOI, that would, that's an amazing, um, that would be an amazing success story. Um, One of the things I'm noticing with these is that they're not really talking about PIDs from a technical, right? Um, we're talking about from a cultural or a um, adoption side, which is great because it's really showing that we have to start translating the values of persistent identifiers and the networking of research. We have to start translating that into um, terminology that people really understand. Yeah, I, I love the comment. There's one, it's stop the madness. No more typing of PIDs into text boxes, intentional actions, like that's, I agree that would that would be a huge success. Is anything else sticking out to you, John? Well, one thing I um I would say is that like when we talk about persistent identifiers, we talk about the, you know, string, the resolvable link that maps to metadata that can be retrievable and how there's so much power when all that happens. And then we talk about the crosswalking that can happen across if you start to create relationships. And so when we talk about that, um, there's a lot of technical goodness and fun ideas that can come out of that. Um, one of the things that we also talk about in some of the talks today um, is about how that translates into user experience and how do people actually interact with it. And so there was a talk earlier today about from Dryad and I think the Stop, Stop the Madness um, comment is also similar, which is when we make like PIDs, we want PID to be something that no one has to think about and that is seamless with user experiences. We don't we, we don't want researchers to necessarily know what their roar is because it should just be more about like, where do I work? Um, but the reality is if you make it too seamless, then people wonder, what are you talking about? And there was a talk about, you know, whether or not um, from the first keynote this morning that was about, should researchers really care about the brand names of PIDs? You know, should they care about what an ORCID is or ROAR or Crossref or data site? Like, should they even know those names? And the researcher was saying, um, Adriana from New Mexico State was saying, yeah, I, I think they should because they have to understand the value. And I think this is one of the challenges that we have is like, 
we want people to be able to have seamless user experiences, but we also want them to understand the value of what a PID can do. And then this gets even more complicated when we go from the researcher who's typing in a submission system to a, a person who works in a grants office who doesn't even get involved in that, but we want them to really care about the value of a PIDs because we want them to understand how things are interconnected. So it's like, we're, we're kind of fighting ourselves around this idea of, of trying to leverage the power, but also keep things, keep things user friendly. Um, and so, I mean, it's a, it's a topic that people use in so many other fields. So I think there's a lot of like culture change, social change, uh, web design, you know, kind of web affordance kind of met, uh, metaphors that we could use and we can learn from. Um, but I think it's one of these kind of big challenges that we have in the PID community around how we can stop the madness, but exploit the goodness kind of a thing. That's a great phrase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Um, yeah, I kind of, I mean, the one that sticks out at me is can I upload all of these? Because, you know, I have like so many of these that I'm like, oh yeah, we're working on that. Hope that happens. You know, and definitely connecting plans with the actual data and preserved data sets is 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 a is a big piece of this and something that we're working really hard to realize. Um, obviously, an enormous challenge, but that's that is the goal, <laughs> or one of the goals. Should we jump to the next um, the next one? Well, um, we're actually out of running oh, out right. of time. Okay, no problem. I I spoke so much that um, that's good. Um, I don't know if it was good, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I just saw a comment from from Reese about um, you know so the comms and education around the benefits of PIDs mm -hmm. is key, and I think that's actually exactly what this whole project was, right? Yeah. And that's what we were trying to say all along is that um, it's not only that that it's key, but it's also very much like role based. I mean, nobody mm -hmm. likes to be pigeonholed, but the person who works in the grants office knows nothing about what we're talking about unless we put it in terms that are applicable to a grants office. And so we have to find ways to not only communicate to like these three kind of typical library researcher, um, you know, tech kind of communities, we have to think about these other communities that really matter. And what are the, what are the ways that they can understand the education and comms around the benefit? So um, I am both a speaker and a moderator here. So I'm like kind of crossing both lines and going over time for my own stuff. So maybe I should learn how to time keep myself. <laughs> um, I don't know, Maria or Cynthia, I know I kind of hijacked the end there, but is there any closing comments that you have before we move on? No, you you were actually supposed to do the closing. So this is, this is really good. I think you wrapped it up well. Um, we'll make sure these slides are shared out. There was just another Padlet about um, helping people think about if they were to take this to their organization, who would be the key stakeholders. And so um, the idea is that folks come away with some idea of how they might implement or um, communicate information from the toolkit and who would be those, those key players. So something to do post Pitapalooza or if you're not busy right now after the session. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and um, say goodbye. Thank you very much to both of you joining. Um, Thank you, guys. Yeah. And Thank you, everyone. Going.